you're going to see that it stops, which means that at this moment, for whatever reason, Dr. Phelps is not breathing. So if we have a patient that we go onto the floor that's in a respiratory rest, and I don't see any waveform like that, what that's telling us again is that at this moment, this patient isn't breathing. Hopkins is home to one of the strongest engineering departments in the world, but engineers need problems to solve. Healthcare is one of the biggest arenas for engineers because there are so many issues where engineering thinking can make a big difference. Locating the pumps, dead batteries, sensors that are off, all that kind of stuff. The Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety was looking for uh, engineers to work on a list of patient safety problems with our clinicians. The Whiting School of Engineering had also expressed interest to us in working more with uh, School of Medicine and we brought the two groups together to uh, come up with uh, real, impactful, translatable solutions to things that are facing our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. The bed alarm was going off like every three like, minutes. Still like still every three minutes. Still like, this is a really important concept that fresh eyes and different perspective can make a really big impact on solving problems and also thinking of the problem in the first place. Because they've been looking at one single thing for 15 years, 20 years, they probably will not realize that there are defects in it because they're used to it. A lot of people think uh, when they hear engineering students uh, writing computer code or software. What was really interesting about this group was um, as Masters of Science and Engineering Management students, they came from all different backgrounds. And what really made them tick was looking at systems and what contributes to a system. So we had them do ethnography research, which is really looking at the anatomy of a problem. So analyzing the system the problem is happening in to figure out what contributed to that problem. Initially we're looking at how we can improve the technology, um, but we sort of like shifted our focus to how we can improve the human aspects of that um, of that relationship. You've got to understand why they think what they think. The first couple of weeks were definitely a learning curve. I had never even worked in a hospital before. We were like those children, you know, going around asking everyone questions. It wasn't just academic, it was real life, which is amazing. Cut, you know, for uh, cardiac, as a teacher, I had some concerns about how the clinicians would respond to these young engineers. And I was thrilled that my students delivered, they recognized the opportunity okay, so they the had, and the clinicians so were outstanding mentors. How many we found that the units we observed were actually really open to our observations. It's one thing to let engineers, you know, observe and tell them what's wrong, but it's another thing to actually implement those solutions. Some of the students are continuing to work with their hosts. Um, to take those pr uh, proposed solutions into action in the hospital. I was amazed by the amount, the, the, the quality of the thinking, the depth of the uh, questions that the students asked, and the professional and um, extremely useful uh, uh, reports that they generated for their clinical hosts. The engineering students gained confidence, skills, problem solving, and all in a situation where they felt like their work mattered. The clinical hosts got a free, valuable perspective in these students that they would normally have to pay a consultant for. What's really great about collaboration in general is that nobody can do, nobody can do it all. Especially in clinical research, if you collaborate, you're going to get more perspectives. Bringing all these perspectives together results in better patient outcomes.